Thank you, Pastor, for this opportunity today. Hello, New Life Church. We sure love you guys. We're thankful for you. I meant to do it, and it slipped away. The day slipped away, but on Thanksgiving, I wanted to go to our volunteer page and say, hey, we are so thankful for each and every one of you, but you do not go unnoticed. You are not unappreciated. We see what you do, and we are just grateful to be a part of serving you in our body, and I'm thankful for today, this opportunity. I believe God has a good word, and I just want to invite him into this portion of the service, so if you'll just pray with me. Father God, we just thank you for this amazing worship. Thank you that you did till up our hearts, Father, that the soil of our heart is open. It's ready, Father, to receive a word from you. God, we thank you that your Holy Spirit goes way beyond my ability to speak. And God, I thank you that in this place today, there will be a spirit of conviction and a spirit of repentance. God, that we would look within ourselves and examine ourselves as we hear the word, that it will wash over us, that it will sanctify us, God, and we will not leave here the same. And we pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. December 1st. That's crazy. Where did the time go? It's the beginning of the Christmas season. And I say beginning because I just could not start celebrating Christmas till Thanksgiving was over. Now, I'm not judging those of you who started in November. That's between you and the Lord. But... Uh, <laughs> I just, I just can do it, and therefore, I still don't have a Christmas tree up, so I'm behind. But uh, my husband, excuse me, yes. Okay, so this morning, he went and got the box up, and he set the tree up, but it's not decorated, and there's, so, there's hours of decorating to do, honey. So anyway. <laughs> But anyway, I was thankful for Pastor to give me this opportunity today, and he told me earlier in the week, and so what I started doing was, I'm like, hey, it's Christmas season, so it's got to be something about Christmas. So I just initially just started reading everything I could about Joseph and Mary, and I was going through all that. But in the midst of it, I had something happen in our lives that really set the stage for the message today. And I don't mean to bore you, and I don't mean to make this about us, but I believe it's a relatable um, circumstance, and it really does set the stage for the message. So bear with me. As a disclaimer... I know our situation isn't the hardest. As a disclaimer, I know some of you have gone through things we can't even imagine, but this isn't about you. <laughs> it's about us. <laughs> and God sees us right where we're at. And so, as many of you know, and I'll, I'll breeze through the details as to not bore you, but um, six months ago in July, my husband was working on the roof of a, a shed he was building, and he ended up actually... Um, bulging and herniating four discs in his back and one was severe and that began this process for us that we'd never been down before in one week we were in the in the doctor's office and emergency room three times we were given prescriptions for pain pills we were given prescriptions for steroids um, we, he was given a shot we were just they were loading us up and we were seeing no change he couldn't sit he couldn't stand and he couldn't lay down which pretty much takes away all your options and we were miserable and again that sent us to the doctor more more appointments, um, CAT scans, x-rays, uh, blood work, all kinds of tests, and that led us to a couple injections in uh, his back. Unfortunately, one was pretty good. It brought some relief. The second one, we didn't notice any difference, and we were just hanging in there to see what to do next, and this encompassed about 12 weeks of our life, which I know some of you have been dealing with illness for 12 years or more, but for us, this was all new. And so about 12 weeks in, my husband started breathing really weird, and I, I was very, I guess, um, non-compassionate because he came out to the recliner going, <gasps> I'm like, seriously, you just came from the bathroom. It's not like you ran a mile. And he's like, I know, I can't explain it. So forgive me, Lord, forgive me, Donnie. <laughs> Because what we found out by taking him to the doctor the next morning was that he had a blood clot in his knee, or from the back of his knee running down to his ankle. And from there, they did um, chest x-rays, CAT scans, and found out that both of his lungs were filled with blood clots, both sides several, which led to a hospital stay and blood thinners and a lot more tests and 
this just keeps going and going. And we're like, when is this going to end? We just wanted his back to feel better, you know? And so we kind of got through that. They wanted to put him on blood thinners. He had to take it easy. Now, this guy, there's not a lazy bone in his body. He's a hard worker. He's active. And it literally broke my heart to see him stuck in that chair. It broke his heart. He hated that room. He didn't want to be there anymore. Melba, can I get an amen, right? And so um, through all of that, we had to go see some specialists. We went to a specialist for his back. Bringing you up to date, this started two weeks ago. Um, we went to a specialist two weeks ago for his back, and the report was grim. They were like, based on where it's located, there's this really great surgery we can do, and we can't do it there. And so his options are fusion, or he can live with this. And we went out to the car, and Donnie's like, well, that's good. I don't have to have surgery. And I'm like, <laughs> I want it fixed. I don't want you to have to live with this. I know what you feel and what you're going through with your pain, and that's not what I want. And so I kind of worked through that. I was sad for a few days about it. And then last week, Friday, we had to go to a pulmonologist because of when they did the x-rays and they did the CAT scan, they found some things in his lungs they weren't happy about, they were very concerned about. And so um, we went to see the pulmonologist, and there was red flags going off all over, and they want to do biopsy, they want to do all this stuff, and they wanted to take it to a tumor board and get specialists' opinion, and this was all Wednesday before Thanksgiving. They gave us a phone call to tell us what's going on. Are you exhausted yet? <laughs> I am. That's been our life for six months. I'm like, I'm so over this. And so we go, they call us, and they said, um, yeah, we need to do some stuff in there, but until he's had a full three to six months of blood thinners, we're not going to touch him. So he needs to go on steroids for the next six weeks. He has appointments in February, appointments in January, appointments in... I'm just like, okay, we're just taking notes, writing all this down. And at some point, I'm just like, I don't like this. Actually, I hate it. This is not what I planned. This is not how I thought life was going to go. And quite personally, I don't want to live life like this. Heck, excuse me. <laughs> Shucks. I am, still, I am still in my 40s. I'm like, I cannot be going through this yet. And of course, I love my husband. And he doesn't want to go through it either. So I feel like I'm complaining for both of us when I say, this is not how we wanted our life to go. This is not where we want to live. And quite frankly, I just want to check out and not do all the appointments that are coming up and all the insurance stuff. And in the midst, yeah, I know you guys know the story. And in the midst of it, pastor asks me to speak, and he's talking about Christmas. He's like, remember, it's Christmas. So I'm like, okay, i got to read everything I can about Joseph and Mary, everything I can about the Christmas stories. I just got to start reading. And as I did, I found out a lot of interesting things about Mary that we just don't usually think about. And so I thought she would be a really great example to look at. But when it comes to Mary, the mother of Jesus, we don't think of her usually for about 11 months of the year. But then on that 12th month, we kind of zoom in on her. And when we think about Mary, there's this, who did the new, the new tradition of reading a chapter a, a day in the book of Luke and ending on Christmas? It starts today, yeah. So if you read that, you're right up with my sermon already. Um, look at Luke 1, 32, 33, and then I'm going to jump to 38. Really quick, let's read this passage. Because when we think of Mary, this is her theme passage. Um, and it's in the New King James, and I'm going to start in the middle. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And verse 31, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and he shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him a throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. So if you guys remember this story, there was a young virgin girl, an angel of the Lord appears to her and says, Hey, this is what we're going to do. You're going to get pregnant. The Holy Spirit's going to come over you, and you are going to give birth to a king. He and explains the son of the highest and throughout the course of their conversation mary says in verse 38 and mary said behold the maidservant of the lord let it be unto me according to your word 
and the angel departed from her. That's what we think of when we think of Mary. And again, it's not usually in July we're thinking of this story. It's right now. And I don't really want, I don't want to belittle it. I think it's powerful. That is the, um, one of the most powerful statements in the Bible. When someone comes to God and says, Lord, let it be to me as you have spoken. We are impressed. We're inspired. We're enamored at her, her willingness and her obedience to God to just jump in and to take this. And we love it, and we applaud her, and the next thing we see is a manger, and around the manger is Mary and Joseph and shepherds and wise men, and there's a baby Jesus, and as soon as we see that, we're like, praise God, Jesus was born. In that moment, we've already set up our decorations and tore them down, and before you know it, Christmas is over, and we move on to New Year's. And that's pretty much what Mary gets in our lives. But what I noticed when I started reading about Mary, there was way more to Mary than getting pregnant by the Holy Spirit and giving birth to a baby. There was more to what God asked Mary to do. He asked her to bring Jesus into this world. That's what he did. He asked her to bring Jesus into this world and Jesus to this world. And when he asked her, she said, yes, I'll do it. That's, she signed up for it. And when I think about us, I think we're not much different. She did it in the, in the natural. She brought Jesus into this world. But God is asking each and every one of us to bring Jesus to this world on a spiritual level. Amen? Yeah. And when I think about Mary, and I want to correlate, and I want to parallel our own lives, I was like, there's way more to Mary than these, this nine-month span. There was way more to what she went through. Um, he didn't just bring Jesus to the world in the month of December. She got to bring Jesus to this world to change the world. She was given the responsibility to bring the Messiah, to bring the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. See, I'm not going to, this isn't about giving Mary all this um, power, authority, and glory. That's not what I'm doing. But I want you to know there were some things that happened in her life that are worth noting. And it's because of her we have the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. It's because of her we're sitting here free today in this church, many of us. It's because of her that we, of her bringing Jesus into this world, that we have forgiveness of our sins. It's because of what she did that Jesus made, was able to make all this possible. It's about Jesus, but I want you to see her role in it, okay? And so as I think about Mary, and as I read about Mary, I realized she lived a full life raising Jesus. She lived a full life. Jesus lived 33 years. She lived beyond that. But a lot more happened in her life, and we don't stop to look at it. And as I did, I found out she's not much different than each of us. And I want to start out by setting the stage. We are all called to bring Jesus to this world. In John 1, 1 through 5, oh, side note, I'm going to use a lot of scripture. I want to tell you why we do that. Because there's a lot of people that don't even open a Bible. There are people that have been raised without the foundation of the word of God. And there are a lot of crazy people in this world that are telling others what the Bible says. And because you've never read it, you're not sure it's even true. And so when we use scripture, it's not because we have to read all these scriptures. It's because you need to know this isn't just our opinion. This is what the word of God says. So as I breeze through these scriptures, it's so you know, this isn't Rhonda's idea. This is what the word of God says. So in John 1, 1 through 5, you will find a scripture that's quoted uh, a lot. And it's, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read on there. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. That's Jesus. That's who Mary brought into this world. We are all called to bring this Jesus, this gospel to people. And that happened through the Great Commission. Many of you know that. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. It says, go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It goes on to say that we're to teach them to observe everything we've been commanded. And then he says, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the ages. The reason I want to lay that out is because you have to know you absolutely can identify with Mary. She brought Jesus in the natural. We're bringing him the spiritual. It's our job to bring Jesus to the world. And it's not just a Christmas season Christianity. It's not just the month of December. So we've got to figure out where we're going, and we want to take a different approach. We want Jesus to be a part of every area of our lives, and we want to be free to do it. 
she set a beautiful example for us, Mary did. If you went back to Luke 138 and you just reread that scripture, it says this, and Mary said, remember, just rewind and remember this, behold the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word, and the angel departed from her. In that moment, Jesus, or God, offered himself to Mary. In that moment, he invited her really into relationship with him, and he's done that to every one of you. Whether you've accepted him or not, if you've accepted him, praise God, you have said, yes, Lord, let it be unto me as you've spoken. I want to live this life, and I want to bring Jesus to this world. There is somebody in here, or maybe someone in here, who hasn't accepted him, and he is saying, I'm asking you today, do you want to know me? Do you want relationship with me? Do you want freedom from the shame and guilt? Do you want to know that there is an eternity that you'll spend with me? Then today, Jesus is asking what he asked Mary. Will you allow me to come and live inside of you and give birth to Jesus inside of you so that you can bring it to the world? It's super important. That day, he asked Mary, this young girl, and he said, this is what's going to happen. And Mary said, let it be unto me. And we usually walk away at that point, but I wonder... I wonder if she wasn't like most girls. I'm going to have a baby. Ah, I'm going to have a baby. This is going to be exciting. I love babies. They're so chubby and they're so cute and you want to kiss them all the time. And there's Joseph. He's so cute. He's so handsome. We're engaged. I'm going to be married. I'm going to have a baby. Well, not that order. And this is going to be awesome. I mean, I can't help but think there's something in her that was really human. We're going to have a really cool clay house. I don't know what they really had back then, you know, and we're going to get a couple donkeys. It's going to be the best life. I have to believe there was something in Mary as a young girl that, that really did get excited about the thought of some of these things. But what we don't realize is when Mary said yes to Jesus, she didn't know what was coming. The title of my message, Mary Didn't Know. Now listen, Mary did know who Jesus was. She did know about his life. She did hear the prophecies about what was going to happen to them. And she watched that unfold through Jesus' entire life. But I do not believe Mary knew what life was going to hold for her. See, we remember, those of you who have studied the word, in Deuteronomy 22.20, Listen to this scripture, but if this, if this thing is true and the evidence of virginity is not found in the young woman, then they shall bring out the young woman to the door of her father's house and the men of her city shall stone her to death with stones because she has done a disgrace in Israel. See, what, what might not have been thought of right away when she said yes was there's a big risk she was taking because according to the law, when she went to be with her husband, if there wasn't a sign of virginity, then she would be stoned for being unfaithful and doing something disgraceful. Did that cross Mary's mind when she said yes? What about Matthew 1, 19 through 24? When Joseph, I want to start on 19, Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not wanting to make a public example of her, was minded to put her away secretly. See, Mary found out, you guys know the story, I'm going to have a baby. Now i got to tell my betrothed, I've got to tell him I'm pregnant, and the baby's not his. And in the natural, he could have been so rude and icky and mean and hateful. I mean, by law, he could have totally just put her out. He could have been the one that called for the stoning. But that his character, being a just man and not wanting to make a public example, he minded to put her away secretly. But God, God got involved. And in that moment, God went to Joseph in a dream. If we read on, and it says in verse 20, well, he was thinking about these things. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which, she is, which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bring forth a son, and his name shall be called Jesus. If you drop down to 24, it says, And Joseph, being aroused from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and took, him to, took her as his wife, whatever, did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and they called his name, Jesus. See, Mary was at risk when she said yes to Jesus. She was willing to do it, but we don't think about the risk she takes. And honestly, if you're going to come to Jesus, if you're serving Jesus, there are risks. There was a risk for her in her life. There was a risk for Joseph and his reputation. Jesus, there was plenty to pay when Jesus came and agreed to this. He gave his life. There are going to be risks if we are going to say yes to Jesus. If we're going to say yes to bringing him to this world, there will be risks. But we don't want to take him. We're selfish. We'll bring Jesus if it's convenient. 
But Mary didn't do that. And as a matter of fact, some of my women's retreat ladies know I shared about a documentary called Sheep Among Wolves. And in that documentary, they focus on Iran and all the people over there that are becoming Christians. It's phenomenal. They say their mosques are empty. It's phenomenal. But you know what? Every single day they get up, they love their family, they hug, they kiss because they absolutely don't know if they will return home that day. But it's a risk worth taking because they understand the value of serving Jesus. As American Christians, we are comfortable and we're lazy. And I'm talking about me. If that offends you, I'm talking about me then. And we're spoiled and we want this to be easy. But you know what? Mary didn't think about that. She just said yes, and she had to deal with the repercussions and the risks that came with saying yes to Jesus. And when you say yes to Jesus, that might be how it is for you too. She might have said, God, you didn't tell me this was going to happen when I said yes. She might have felt just like us. Another thing that Mary felt was extreme pressure when she was going through this. Can you imagine? Just look at a few scriptures with me, and I want to start with Luke 2, 10 through 14. When we read the Christmas story, out in the field there were a bunch of shepherds and an angel appears to the shepherds and he says to them, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. I'll stop right there. They said all of this to the shepherds, and the shepherds got seriously excited. And they're like, let's go find that baby. And so they ran into Bethlehem, and here's sweet little Mary. Sweet little Mary, just a young young adult girl, really, sitting with this baby that she had in a barn. And still reeling, probably. And these shepherds come and tell her that she has, let let me just read it so I don't mess it up, born to you today in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Hey, they didn't say cute baby. They didn't say, wow, he has your eyes. He's the Savior of the world. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Can you imagine hearing that about your baby? Well, it wasn't long after he was born, they went to the temple, and they wanted to dedicate him back to the Lord. And we find in Luke chapter 2, 27 through 32, that Simeon was there. And when Simeon saw him, listen to what he said in verse 30. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the, fa- before the face of all people, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and a glory of your people Israel. This is what she heard about her baby, that he was going to be a light to the Gentiles. I don't even think she could wrap her brain around that at that moment yet. But this is the prophecy she's hearing about her kid. And while she was there, Anna came in Luke 2, 36 through 38. I'm going to jump to 38. And she said, in an instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke to him and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. (gasps) He's here, you guys. He is the redemption of Jerusalem, this baby right there. I can just see this young girl taking all this information in and all of a sudden going, I can't do this. You know, I was just hoping that I could get nursing down. I was just hoping I could figure out how to to take care of this kid. And I am raising the king of the world, the savior, the light to to the, uh, no, Gentiles. (laughs) The light to... I can see her going, I can't do this. And a lot of times when when we're walking in this world of loving and serving the Lord, we're like, I can't do this. I know I'm called to bring Jesus to people. I know that's the mandate. I'm supposed to be bringing Jesus, but you know what? I mess up. I fail all the time. I can't offer Jesus when I don't do everything right. You know what? It's a lie from the devil. He wants to keep you from offering Jesus. He tells me that too. Rhonda, you're a loser. You're a failure. You mess up. You can't do this. And you know what I say? You're right. I can't. But in Jesus, in Jesus, I can. And I don't let the pressure of of loving and serving God, the pressure of this world around us to offer Jesus, I don't let that weigh on me. I just tell the devil who I am in Christ. See, you aren't who the devil says you are. You are exactly who God says you are. You are holy because he's holy. There's nothing in you that makes you holy. There's nothing in me but Jesus in me. In his righteousness, I can stand in right standing, right? And so I want you to know, when Mary was walking through this, yes, Lord, let it be unto me as as you have spoken, she didn't realize there was going to be a lot of pressure along the way. But when she got into the middle of it, I believe God's grace was sufficient like it will be for each and every one of us. 
and don't buy the lie. Be bold and bring Jesus to this world and don't let it be a reflection of how you are. See, they don't want who you are. They want who Jesus is. So don't let the pressures of this world keep you from bringing Jesus to this world. Amen? Another thought about Mary that I just, when I read it, I'm like, oh, that's so good. God, is they weren't rich. They were not rich. Okay, God, let it be unto me as you've spoken, and I want a really new crib, and I want a great changing table, and I want everything to match, and I want to do some stencil on the wall. It's going to be so pretty. And no, that could have been what she expected. Sometimes when we, when we make this relationship with God and we sign up and we enter in with God, we expect him to give us everything we, he, that he can and everything that we want, but that's not how it goes. As a matter of fact, look at Luke 2, 22 through 24. Remember when I said they came to bring Jesus to the Lord, to dedicate him at the temple? Listen to Luke 22. It says, Now when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were complete, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And I'm going to jump to 24. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. That's what they brought as a sacrifice. But if you jump back into Leviticus 12, 8, and you look at what the sacrifice is for this specific situation, it's actually a lamb. And this is what 12, 8 says. And if she is not able to bring a lamb, then she may bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons. One is a burnt offering and the other is a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for her. You guys, she couldn't bring what was required. She didn't have the money. I looked up the commentary on that. The reason she wouldn't bring a lamb is because she was poor and she could not afford to bring the lamb. But God brought provision. And Mary could have been mad and said, when I said, yes, I thought you'd do this for me. You know, we do that to God. Money's tricky. Money's sick. It really is. It's a sick thing. It has a sick hold on our lives. And as long as we have plenty of it, we often get distracted and God doesn't get his rightful place as a priority in our life. But then when we don't have enough of it, we're in self-pity, we're depressed, we're discouraged, we're sad, we're ungrateful. And that in turn takes away from our attention to God. And do you see, Mary had to deal with the weight of that. We don't have everything we want. We don't have everything that maybe I think would be perfect for this situation. But it didn't stop her from doing what God had called her to do. It didn't cause her to waver in her commitment to God. But is it causing you to? Our, I was thinking about it. I, when, when, money, when it gets to money, we get serious with God and we tell him. We tell him. You own the cattle on a thousand hills. Why aren't you blessing me? I tithe. Why aren't you giving to me? And we get mad and sometimes we shut down and sometimes we check out because God's not doing financially what we think he should do. It's a very immature approach to serving God. God is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. And just like that story, God didn't say, you didn't have a lamb, get out. He said, hey, how about two turtle doves? That'll work. How about that? Mary could have said, I hate this. I'm so embarrassed. We're supposed to bring a lamb. Can't you get another job? Can't you do something? I don't want to go. She could have been thrown a fit like many of us do when it comes to finances. But you know what? She didn't. She saw the provision of God. And I want to tell you guys, I don't know what it is if it's just me I am seeing the hand of God over and over and over and over in people's lives. It is mind-boggling. If you are watching, God is moving. I like that song that you sang for the end. I would love that song. He is the way maker. He is the promise keeper. He is the light in the darkness. And all the other things that Liz said. But we don't, you know, we don't want any, we don't want any problems. And if we don't ever have any problems, he can't make a way for us. And we don't want the, the darkness at all. We want it to be light, but then he can't show up and be that light in the darkness. I want to challenge you. Don't you let money and don't you let finances uh, cause you to waver from your commitment to Christ. It did not cause Mary to waver, and yet she endured it. How about this? She had to flee and to fear. They had to re relocate to another country out of fear for their baby. Matthew 2.13 says this. The wise men had left, and an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take, I lost my place, arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek, uh, seek the young child to destroy him. And in 14 and 15, when he arose, now listen to this, he took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt, because they were waiting for Herod 
for Herod's death before they could come back. We are such wimps when it comes to life, aren't we? Okay, my sister-in-law said I was complaining about Donnie's situation. She was like, oh, it's all about you, isn't it, Rhonda? I, go, I get mad at her a lot. I wanted to go, it is about me. <laughs> I'm married to him, and I have to go through it too, Peggy. <laughs> but that's how we act toward God. That's how we act. It's about me. But it really isn't about us. When we think of it, when's the last time your husband woke you up and said, quick, grab the baby. It's the middle of the night. we got to get out of here. He's going to be killed. That's never happened. I would be shocked if anybody in here raised their hand. That doesn't happen. But you know what? She lived that way, and she could have said, seriously, God? Seriously? This is what you're doing? When I was willing, do you realize we had to leave our home? I had to take a 90-mile donkey ride, nine months pregnant. I get here. There's no family around. My first baby. I'm a young girl. It's, this isn't fair. And then they put me in a stable with animals and hay and it's dirty and gross the least you could do was give us safety I didn't get to be around my mom who could give me input in my family I had to be here and if that wasn't bad enough now we have to go to Egypt in the middle of the night someone wants to kill my baby yeah that's what that's what Mary got to deal with those are the things she had to work through in her mind I want to tell you I think she I think she was just like us I think she hated some of these things but there was something so remarkable about her response that, yes, Lord, be it unto me as you have spoken, that I believe it paved the way for the rest of her walk with God. Church, take a, take a lesson from that. Some of you waver in your, in your commitment to the Lord. And if you're wavering, then when hard times come, you're going to be blown away like a, like a reed in the wind. But she, I believe that the, the way she addressed that caused her to be firm even when the hard things came i don't think people think much about mary's other children at least i didn't according to matthew 13 53 through 56 and i don't want to read it all but i'll jump down to 55 it says is this not the carpenter's son is not his mother called mary and his brothers james joseph simon and judas and his sisters are they not all with us what Mary was called to raise Jesus. You guys, she had, I think she had a job on her hands because he was God in man form, just like when he ran off to the temple and didn't tell him at 12. I think that was a real good indication of what she was dealing with. And I think it said that he, he came into line and he was obedient, but he was amazing. And I think that pressure and going, okay, I get to nurture him. I get to spank him. I get to teach him. I get to love him. That sounds like a lot because he's going to be king of kings and lord of lords. And he's going to be the Messiah. But in that time frame, some commentator said she had at least six other kids. And I would think that Jesus alone would be a handful. But in the midst of raising Jesus, she raised a whole family. But we don't think about that. Oh, Mary, she's in the main, there's the baby in the manger, sweet. Yeah, she had six. How many had four kids? You guys are saying how that is. Yeah, right? Six. Not only did she have other children, six is an estimate, I don't think they know for sure. But in John 7, 4 through 5, listen to this. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. This is his brother speaking. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Verse 5, for even his brothers did not believe in him. Not only did she have other kids, but her kids didn't believe in him and who he was. Can you imagine go, working through that? Yeah, you can, because there, every one of you in this place probably has an unsaved loved one that you pray for on a daily basis, an unsaved brother, father, mother, sister, child, friend that you wish would come to the Lord. And it's painstaking. I know some of you pray daily in tears for their salvation. Can you imagine the, the turmoil within Mary, seeing her boys that don't believe and seeing that Jesus being called to all that he's called to be? Can you imagine that turmoil? That's what Mary got to deal with. It's not much different than some of you. But I want to say the key here is initially they didn't believe. That gives us hope. Those boys came to believe in who Jesus was. And I want you to know, this is important. Some of you are praying for unbelieving relatives. God wants them to believe as much as you do. 
And God loves it when we pray according to his will. So pray according to his will. Father, no one comes to you unless you draw him. Don't give up. Mary knew what it was like to have children that didn't believe, but don't give up because God is good and he wants your loved ones saved as much and more than you do. Amen? Amen. Mary had to deal with family and lack of belief. She had to deal with death. This was interesting reminder to me. Joseph is not mentioned after Jesus went to the temple at the age of 12 and snuck away and they went and found him. Joseph's name is not mentioned again in the Bible. So what does that mean? Well, we just assume that Joseph trained him up till he was 30 in the, in the carpenter shop and then he went out and did ministry. But listen to this in Mark 6, 3. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? If Joseph was alive, he would be the son of Joseph. And so the word of God is showing us that he wasn't present. How about this? John 19, 25 through 27. Now there stood at the cross of Jesus, his mother. We're jumping ahead a little bit, but this is when Jesus is hanging on the cross. And he looks down in verse 26, and he sees his mother and the disciple whom he loved. And he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, um, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his home. That would not have been necessary if Joseph was alive. She wouldn't need someone else caring for her, and she wouldn't need to go to someone else's home. Somewhere in there, from the time Jesus was 12 till he started his ministry, Joseph passed away. Mary, can you imagine? God, this is too big for me to carry on my own. You know who he's supposed to be. I can't do this. I need Joseph. He got it. He heard from you. He believed. He was my support. We were working together in this. And I got six other kids. Mary had to deal with death. Oh, but we just see the little nativity. We're like, oh, Mary, she's so sweet. We'll put that away in January. Mary was just like us. She was called to bring Jesus to this world, and there was no promises. It wasn't contingent on everything being perfect in her life. And sometimes that's how we feel. You guys, we've all experienced loss. Some of you, it's fresh. Some of you are still in the grieving process, but it is not an excuse to quit offering Jesus to this world. As a matter of fact, if you're real, and if you're honest, and if you grieve, I'm going to just tell, tell a little story. You guys, I don't know if you guys know, we didn't mention it, but Bob McGlemory ended up having an emergency hernia surgery this week on Monday. And I think his kids were leaving today. But anyways, they came to be with him. I was visiting with Bob, and you guys remember he lost Nettie about three years ago. And we were up at the hospital, and I said, Bob, just because I talk to people all the time in grief, how did you deal with losing Nettie? And he looked at me, Bob, the hard worker. He's like 85. He's always up on a ladder somewhere. You know, he's just amazing. And he said, Rhonda, I just cried a lot. He said, I just cried a lot. I just let it out. He goes, I'd be moving along, and I would get overwhelmed, and I'd just stop and cry it out. Why do we think we can't do that? Why do we think we have to be strong? Why do we stuff that? You know what? Let out that grief. It's a process. You're not going to escape it. And do it so that you can be healthy and be about bringing Jesus to this world. It's okay to grieve. And I bet you Mary did. Because she's a lot like us. And when she said yes, it did not make her exempt from the loss and death. Through all of that, I think of Mary and I'm like, wow, she went through a lot. And I bet she thought many days this is not how I wanted it to be. This is not what I signed up for, but God is good and gracious, and he doesn't just leave us there. My last few points go like this, a life fulfilled. She was there when Jesus started his ministry. In Luke 3, 23, now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age. We know that to be true, and I love this. She was there. She's a good mom. Ladies, it's good to be around our kids and be invested in their life. John 2, 1 through 4, this is such a fun scripture. On the third day, there was a wedding in Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding, and they ran out, when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, Jesus, come here, Jesus. They ran out of wine, and I love this next line. He is so funny. He goes, woman, 
what does your concern have to do with me? He's like, mom, please shh, keep it down. It's not time. She's just a classic mom. You know, she's like, are you kidding me? I've been praying about this and thinking about this. I have known who you are for all for 30 years. It's time. My son will take care of this. And guess what? He did. He took care of it. And listen to this, John 2.11. This, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. What a joy it must have been for her to start seeing the fulfillment of all the things she knew about Jesus from all those years ago. Hey, look around your own life. Jesus is fulfilling his promises to you. He is giving you provision. He is giving you protection. He is giving you help. He is giving you comfort. He is giving you strength. Are you watching to see what Jesus is doing in your life? Because when you do, you get excited and you want to take it to somebody else. You want to take Jesus to the world. I'm so thankful Mary got to be a witness to to his ministry. And I'll go one step further. I believe that somewhere in that three years, Mary transitioned from mother of God, uh, uh, mother of Jesus, to follower of Jesus. I believe it with all my heart. She watched God move through him. She watched the Holy Spirit, and she was like, yes, I've been praying for this. I've been thinking about, he's doing it. He's amazing. You silly kids, believe in your brother. Look at him. How could you not? And I believe somewhere in there, she became a follower of Christ, which is important because she also witnessed his death. But I want you to know, well, and let's just touch on that. It's just wrong for kids to die. It is. It's just sad. It's hard. It's unfair. I didn't sign up for this. You can do anything. That's a real emotion and a real feeling, and Mary experienced it. But do you know what I think helped her through it? Is the fact that he had become her savior. He had. He had become the Messiah. And so even though this was dreadful and horrible to go through, she had listened to his teachings. She had known this isn't the end, that I will see him again. I'll get to spend eternity with him. Some of you mamas and daddies need to know that's the hope we have with our children. We get to see them again. Mary knows. She experienced it. She experienced it. But then I believe, and I want to just reference John, and I'm almost done, 19, 25 through 28. And this is so cool. Behold your mother now there stood by the cross. Excuse me. Behold your mother now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother. And his mother's sister, Mary, where am I at? Yeah. And his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother, and I read the scripture earlier, she looked at her and said to John, this is your mom, this is your son. She was at every important thing, even the hard things. And I believe at that moment, she wasn't just mom. She was disciple and follower. And I know death is hard. We've all gone through loss. But I want you to know, we do not mourn like those who have no hope. Praise Jesus for the eternity spent with him. That's what we get to look forward to. Mary knows she experienced that. What she didn't know was she was going to go through all these things in her life when she signed up and said yes. And finally, this is so cool. Coolest part. It's closed my message. Acts 1, 12 through 15. Then they returned to Jerusalem. Okay, Jesus had just met with the, with the disciples, and he ascended. And listen to this. They returned to Jerusalem from the mall called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. Verse 14. They all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Amen. See, I just, I look at that scripture and I go, wow, I want to follow the example of Mary. When she signed up, she had no idea that she would go through risk and she would go through pressure and she would go through poverty. She had no idea there, she'd have to flee, that they, she had to fear for her children's lives. She had no idea she would go through and experience death. When she signed up, she didn't know. And when you signed up to serve God, you didn't know that either. But what I love is she started strong and she finished strong. 
she said yes to Jesus. And on that day, I can imagine her watching as he was ascending. I imagine her gathering into this room with all the disciples. I can imagine her praying till the Spirit, the Holy Spirit came. And I can imagine her going, you know what? I spent my life bringing Jesus into this world. Now I'm going to spend my life giving Jesus to this world. That, that resolve in her because she saw his faithfulness. She didn't live an enamored life that was just fluffy. And I want some of you to know you're not alone in how you're feeling. You might say, I didn't sign up for this. And you needed to hear today, you need a new resolve. You need a new resolve. You need to do what Mary did just like that and say, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but God, I want to serve you. I love those quotes from Job. Though you slay me, I'll serve you. From Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And take away any contingency. Take away any of your own um, guidelines that you put on God. Let him go and just be willing to bring Jesus to the world. Is there anybody in here that says, yeah, Rhonda, I need to be willing to bring Jesus to this world. And I've let too many things of the day distract me from doing that. Is there anyone in there that feels that way? I'm the only one that goes, I don't really want to live this way. I really want us to walk away from this message today with a new resolve, especially this Christmas season, that Peggy, it's really not about me. It's not about me and it's not about now. You are faithful. And God, in the midst of it, I yield to you. No contingencies. I surrender my expectations. I want to serve you. And like Mary, at the end, I just want to be worshiping with the disciples, watching God live a fulfilled life, and being strong in my own relationship with him. Amen.